Hey, I'm Alex Rackliff from Board Game Co, and this is a first impressions of Lorcana, the newest trading card game from Ravensburger, or Ravensburger, or Ravensburger. I believe it's actually pronounced both ways, depends on where you're from. My voice is a bit hoarse, I just came back from Gen Con, I had the opportunity to dive into Lorcana and to give a, a bit of a sense of play, uh, only with the starting deck so far, I have not yet gone into uh, deck crafting, primarily because I only have a five booster packs to go through, which is just not really that much to build up your own deck, although it may be enough to actually tweak the starting decks to my preference, but I'm not there yet. Although I will say my daughter opened up a uh, pack over here and got a foil beast wolfsbane over here. So we got a foil legendary in one of our packs, which that currently goes in a card divider until I can decide just exactly how I want to deal with my kids and uh, these packs of cards. You see, Lakana has generational appeal. That's one of these reasons why I think this game will stick around for a long time. In fact, if you are watching this channel, hi, welcome to the channel. I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. Feel free to hit that like, subscribe, stick around for any number of board game things. I don't know, I don't know who you are. You might be a regular subscriber. You might be here just for Lurkana and all that stuff, but I will probably have regular Lurkana content on the channel for the foreseeable future. By foreseeable future, I mean until I stop playing it. You see, um, I'm interested in Lurkana. I I've been out of TCGs for a long time. I played Magic the Gathering well before I ever got into board games. I played Magic the Gathering for five, six years for a decent amount of time, got heavily into it. It didn't really compete that much, but often would go to, you know, Friday Night Magic, draft sets, all that stuff, played online, built my own decks, uh, bought lots on Ebays. I, I was very into Magic the Gathering for a long time, enjoyed the ride, and then one day was like, you know what, it's a lot, and I don't know if I'm going to keep keeping up with it. And so I kind of stopped and slowly sold off bits of my collection. In fact, I finally sold off my last 20 or 30 decks I had built. I had built decks over the years that were my favorite decks, and I had them in a deck box. Even when I got rid of everything else and stopped collecting new magic, I still had preset decks to go with. And I, I got rid of those to fund my board game collection as I was getting into board games. And so I'm back with Lorcana, my first TCG in a very, very, very long time. A 13, 12, 12-ish years roughly to be into this. Anyways, Lakana. What is Lakana? Let's talk about this. I will be, I'll be exploring this. I'll be exploring this until I decide I no longer want to do so. Lakana will be coming out with sets every few months. I have an interview with the designer going up, and myself and Meg have an interview with the designer or the co-designer of Lakana. They'll be going up to the channel as well. I will be opening packs, uh, playing the game, doing various things as I explore the universe and see how long the appeal holds, because the appeal definitely is there. This is a generational game. It has all those Disney characters you know, your kids know, your parents know. All those characters are all there so that you can engage with this universe and get into the concepts of a TCG, get into the basic back and forth, and establish who will get to 20 lore first while playing with characters you know, while building decks either around the mechanics you know or around the theme you know. My first Magic the Gathering deck I ever built, this video is going to be a hodgepodge of things across the spectrum here, but my first Magic deck I ever built was specifically built around... I don't even remember the name. The cats. Uh, the Johnny. The Johnny. Was that the Johnny? I don't remember their names. I mean, I don't remember the exact names of the characters. But my first deck I ever built in Magic the Gathering was specifically th themed around the cat characters. I didn't yet know the game well enough to try to build a mechanically based deck. I just built it based on the characters. Like, oh, let's just put a bunch of these guys together. Let's build a white deck. It seems to have a lot of guard, and I don't remember all this. I, it's been a long time. But I built thematically first, and I'm, I'm assuming my kids will, although I, I'm going to build mechanically. But either way, Lakana, this has been way too long of a ramble. What is Lakana? Let's talk about the basic idea of the game, how it works, how it operates, and my first impressions of it so far. Way too long in this video. Lakana is a game where you're going to build out a deck of cards. You're going to choose two colors specifically, or it's more specifically called inks. You have six inks in the game, and you're going to t pick any two inks and craft your deck from there. You're going to have sets of cards in those de in the decks. I believe, if I recall correctly, double check it. I have not done deck construction yet, but I believe you have three of any one copy amongst you know those two colors, those two inks, and then from there the goal is to get to 20 lore first. Alternatively, you also lose if you run out of cards, so you can mill an opponent's deck. I guess I haven't seen that much mill abilities, but if you can pace it out, run your opponent of time, if you run out of cards, you lose the game. But the goal is to get to 20 lore, and the way you're going to do that is these cards have these uh, questing abilities. So you can have a few things to know about the card. You're going to have the actual cost of the card, which is up in that corner. You have the difference between inkable cards and non-inkable cards. These are inkable cards. That's non-inkable, as you can see over there. That means this cannot be used as a resource. These can be used as a resource. Over here, you have their strength when they're attacking, their defense, how much life they have, and then their questing strength when they go on quests, their flavor text down here, 
here, the rarity down at the bottom, any keywords, and then over here you might have abilities as well when you deal with the card, either because it's a character or a spell or any of those things as you go through the game. And so you're playing with all of these as you go through it, but let's start off. The basic start of the game is going to have you picking seven cards, and right now we have this, uh, I don't remember which deck this is, but I guess it's the uh, yellow one, so it's going to be the Amber Amethyst deck. The Amber Amethyst deck from the three possible starting decks that have all the colors in play. We're going to draw seven cards, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You have the opportunity to semi-mulligan, which basically means you look at your hand of cards, and then depending on the cost, the inkable or non-inkable, whatever things you want, you're going to decide any number of cards that will go underneath your deck, they're going to go at the bottom of your deck, and then you're going to draw back up to seven, and that will be your starting hand. Here we have a hand that is almost all inkable, all, almost all of these can be used for resources. We have a lot of low-value cards. Now keep in mind, this is a starting deck, which means it's meant to be friendly, it's meant to be easy to jump in and not have to wait until turn seven to play your first card. This deck is built to be accessible and dive into the game. From there, I actually like all my cards. If I was playing it more competitively, maybe I'll go ahead and mulligan some, but I won't right now. You know, maybe I'll say that these two ones seem unnecessary. In fact, we have enough three ones. I'm going to get rid of those. I'm going to take these two. Too many low-cost cards might be bad for us. I'm going to tuck them under my deck, and I'm going to draw two cards to replace it, and that's my hand over here. And again, we have these two colors here. So we have Amber and Amethyst as our two colors over here, and each color does have a degree of, of attribute to the way they play or their play styles. Although characters will bounce back and forth between colors, you'll find Mickey in variety of colors, and across the Disney universe that will hold true. From there, because I'm going first, I will not draw a card. Normally on your turn, it's draw, set, and play, I believe the term is. And when you draw a card, you draw a card off the top of your deck, then you do any abilities, and then you start taking all your actions as you go. And so right now, because I'm the first player, I will skip my draw phase. After that, every player will draw at the start of the turn. I will pick a card, and I'm going to go ahead and ink it. I'm going to take that card. We have two Dr. Facilios over here. And again, for the sake of just simplicity, I'm going to take one of those. I'm going to show my opponent that it's inkable. I'm going to place it down onto my board. It's an inkable card. Let's get rid of these cards, because they're not actually play and I have my first ink my first resource and I'm going to go ahead and exhaust that ink I'm going to go ahead and exhaust it or not tap it definitely not tapping it I'm going to exhaust that ink and I'm going to play my dingle hopper which over here actually it's terrible, I don't know why I did that, I probably should look at my card first over here. Uh, Dingle Hopper is actually not a card you can really play off hand because it helps you out later, it's cheap, it's affordable, but it's more for the late game, so that's it, that's my turn. My opponent goes, goes and takes their turn, it comes back to me, I go ahead and you know what, maybe grab some opponent cards, let's pretend my opponent takes Mini Mouse and they put Mini Mouse in play on their first turn, which means they have a 1-3 creature in play. Okay, I'll deal with it. No abilities, a 1-3 questing, but the ink is wet. That's the cute little terminology. The ink is wet. You can't use a character on your first turn, and so Minnie does nothing. She can't go questing. You cannot go ahead and move your tracker, and you can use dice over here. The game gives you a few tokens over here. They don't really, in the starter box over here, these aren't great. I'm sure they'll be deluxified kits of tokens. For right now, I'll just use dice. You do have this little starting tracker over here, so this tracks our, our questing, our lore. So we need to get to 20 lore. I actually start with zero. You don't start with 20. You need to work your way up, so I have zero lore right now. Back to my my turn. I'll draw a card. I'll take that card. I'll look it over here. We got Ariel. I'm going to go ahead and play a card. In fact, I don't really need to worry about damage yet, so I think I'm going to take that Dingle Hopper and I'm going to go ahead and place it down as ink. I show my opponent it's inkable. I place it down and then I can go ahead and play Dr. Facilier over here, which I'll do so. He's a 0-4 creature, challenger 2. While challenging, this character gains plus 2. So when I challenge another character, when I go ahead and attack, so to speak, effectively you can't really attack characters in this game. The goal is to quest, the goal is to get lore. But once a character does quest, then they're, they're, they're vulnerable. You can go ahead at that point and challenge that character. So right now, I go ahead and exhaust my ink over here, I place Dr. Facilier, he goes and play, and again, his ink is dry, so to speak. My opponent, let's find them a decent 2-cost card. Let's make it thematic, let's play the playing a, a red-orange deck over here. Here, an amethyst, an amethyst ruby deck over there, and they're going to go ahead and play down Minnie Mouse over here with a two-three creature. Their ink is dry. Again, we're ignoring their ink. Let's go ahead and give them some ink and whatnot to uh, show you that they're playing legally or whatnot as we go through it. They have their cards, cards in play, and then they go ahead and they go questing with Minnie, and they move their their lore track up one. They now have one lore. I need to figure out how to respond to that because I can attack Mini, but I'll take a damage. Is there anything else I can do to better my position? Well, let's go ahead and start by drawing a card. Let's see what we got. We got another Ariel over here. Let's see what we want to do over here. I could play part of your rule. The character with cost three or more can sing the song for free. Return a character card from your to your hand. Not good yet. Not a lot I can do right now. I have a bunch of aerials over here, and that will be helpful. They're three, four creatures. For right now, I think I'm going to go ahead, and I could right now challenge Minnie to try to attack Minnie. I don't know if I care enough right now. I take one damage. I would deal two to her. I could take out in two turns. I think I'm going to simply quest myself, moving up my lore by one. I'm going to have that aspect there. Goes back to their turn. They'll refresh everything else. And then we'll find them a nice healthy card for them to play. 
And they're going to go ahead and play Sebastian. They're going to go ahead and ink a card. So they're going to ink a card over here. They're going to play Sebastian. They now have a third card in play. And they're going to go questing with both their characters, putting them at three ink. And Sebastian's ink is dry and he can't go. My goes to my turn. I refresh my cards. I draw up a card over here. And then I try to see what I can play over here. I just got Flotsam over here. Ursula Spy, who's a 3-4 creature with Rush. I can challenge the turn they're played. That's a useful trick to have up my sleeve later. They're not inkable, but the trade-off is well worth it. I have plenty of inkable cards. I'm going to go ahead. Ooh, I do have Mickey Mouse the Sorcerer over here, but I'm going to go ahead. I forgot to ink a card last turn. That was probably a mistake. We'll pretend to ink a card. We'll pretend I did ink a card last turn. Let's just pretend I did. Uh, let's put part of your roll down over there, and then we're going to go ahead and um, let's play. Do you want to play Ariel? This character can't tap to sing songs. That's tricky. I think I'm just going to play Mickey Mouse and sort and play over here. So we have our foil Mickey Mouse. We're going to go ahead and put him to play. He has two questing over there, and he has animate broom. You may pay one less to play broom characters. And whenever one of your broom characters is banished in a challenge, you may return the card to your hand. That's really helpful to be able to get some of our cards back into our hand. Meanwhile, from here, again, I have a choice, and this back and forth is how you continue. I'm not going to keep going right now, but that's the basic idea. As a character challenges, let's just show you actually, let's just show you how an attack would play out. Let's pretend I do attack with Dr. Fasilier. I do challenge. I would go ahead and put down two damage markers on Mini. She still has three health, so she's still alive. She deals one damage back to me. I have four health, so I'm definitely alive, and that card has been attacked. But I didn't get to get, generate my own lore because I was so busy attacking as I went through it. And then we go back and forth in that sequence. Now my character is vulnerable as well. When a character is exhausted, that's when you can challenge them. So as, it's a constant balance of trying to be mindful of the cards in your hand, how you build out your deck, what your deck is good at, and those strengths of those cards, how your deck operates together, when it's worth trading characters, it's going to have a lot of the decision space of a typical TCG game, which is where we'll dive into my first impressions of Lakana, understanding that it is very much first impressions. I will continue to have thoughts and opinions, opinions around this game on this channel as I go through the game, because I want to explore where Lakana goes. I want to explore how this universe develops as, as we go through it, because I like Lorcana currently. Lokana is interesting right now because right now it's still early days. Right now the decision space is still, again, for me, I've been engaging with starter decks, which means I haven't been able to play around with some of the deck construction and seeing where abilities can go. So a lot of the, the nuance, the, the subtleties, how you build things, how you play, how you learn your cards, how you learn your opponent cards, a lot of those subtleties currently are still lost on me until I explore it further. And obviously as a game that's coming out with four sets a year, one set every single quarter, every three months, going to be a new set coming out with new cards, new ways to integrate. I don't yet know the rules around how they're going to play around with Constructed, like what's the format going to be, the last two years of decks, the last year of decks, anything completely different. I don't know their rules yet. They haven't really released a lot of their rules yet, and so we'll find out together. But for right now, I like Lurkana for a few reasons. I like the IP. Like I said already, it has generational appeal. Uh, playing cards from movies I know, building a deck both thematically and mechanically has charm. Using your characters to progress further. The fact that you're counting up to 20 lore as opposed to counting down 20 life. Again, I'm coming at it from the perspective of a, of a Magic player. I like that nuance change. It feels a little bit more peaceful, even though it kind of amounts to the same thing, but not really. It also provides an interesting tension because it's not purely attack or not. Sometimes maybe you don't quest. Maybe you don't quest because maybe by questing you make your character vulnerable. Maybe you play that defense of a game, hold your characters back, but then the problem is maybe you're not making progress and your opponent is, and so there has that trade-off. It has a trade-off of understanding where your deck is strong, when to outpace your opponent, when to play them out, when to wait them out. There's a lot of decision space that will be present, as in any game with complexity through just sheer amount of cards, because you will have a lot of cards. I think there's around 200 plus cards or so in the uh, the starting set of Arcana. There's an app you can download for free to look at the cards and see what's out there, and so you can start crafting with your imagination, so to speak, which is, I guess, thematically is the the goal of Lorcana as you craft with your imagination, but you can craft with your imagination the kind of deck you want to build. You can build your decks and then hunt down those cards later. Try to find the cards that work for you as you figure out what your what your play style is, which combination of inks will work well together to feed what you're trying to do. And so we have uh, so far a degree of simplicity to it. I haven't yet seen a ton of cards that are overly complicated. They do seem to give you ways to work together so that you can build. We just saw with Mickey a second ago how broom cards will cost you one less. Well, how much can you work around the mechanic? How much can you work around trying to get cheaper broom cards? How much can you feed into that? How much do you want to mulligan at the beginning of the game? I don't believe it's called mulligan. It's whatever it's called, redrawing your hand, whatever it is. But as you go through those, there's going to be lots of decisions you make as you go through it. Any TCG player knows that it's just as much as uh, about the crafting of the deck as it is about what you deal with your hand, how to deal with a bad hand, how to ensure you're you're playing your opponent as much as you're playing the cards. There's a lot of nuance and strategy in, in these kinds of games, and it's not obviously it's not always immediately apparent at first. 
That simplicity of picking any two colors, merging them together, having a single common color of ink, it makes the game accessible in terms of the strategy. I'm also a Hearthstone player. I've played a lot of Hearthstone. That's the closest I've come to TCG since leaving Magic. Haven't really gone heavily into that. That I've bought, like, you know, the solo adventures. And so between Hearthstone and Magic, there's a commonality here. And there's a, a again, an accessible game that plays well, that has that lasting damage. I always appreciated the nuances of Magic the Gathering, of the way you'd have to, like, deal damage all at once. I always appreciated that. And we don't seem to be leaning heavily into the degree of just how many abilities there are just yet, how many instances of sorceries or that kinds of thing. It seems to be very much focused on you trying to achieve your 20 lore. Try to achieve your 20 lore, try to get there and figure out what you need to do to get there either faster than your opponent or better than your opponent through the cards you play. Right now, Lorcana has, it has beautiful art, beautiful production. It has the hype and buzz of something new. It has that generational appeal of characters that are going, again, they're going to appeal to your kids, yourself, and your parents all at the same time, which makes it an easy game to table. Uh, everyone I know currently is excited about Lorcana, which means you can just easily have a deck. If you walk around with a deck that you've constructed, at any game convention, there's a decent chance you'll be able to find someone to be able to play Lorcana with very easily, and that makes the game easier to dive into. The hype will, to a certain extent, carry this game for a long time, and how well the game is designed, how well they manage organized play, those are all going to be factors as far as where it ends up. I would say that my overall my overall opinion of Lorcana right now comes down to this one sentence, which kind of makes me feel bad about making you sit through the entire video to get there. Right now, I am charmed by Lorcana. I think it's beautiful. I want it to do well. This is not one sentence I lied to you. I'm charmed by Lorcana. I think it's beautiful. I want it to do well, and I've enjoyed my plays of it so far. I am not yet 100% convinced. I think the IP, to a large extent, is carrying the game right now. It doesn't mean it's not good. I think it is good, but good games are a dime a dozen. And in the world of the big three or the big four, if you count Flesh and Blood, we have Pokemon, we have Magic the Gathering, we have Yu-Gi-Oh! And then Flesh and Blood a little bit to an extent as well in that world. And it's hard to break into that world. The IP will certainly help Lorcana do so. But how well the game holds up, how well the game develops set after set, how much opportunity it allows for creativity, both thematically for those who want to embrace the game that way, as well as mechanically for those who want to craft a game that, that plays well, and that gives you a lot of agency, choice, and structure. Those are all things that are going to determine where this game ends up. I want to see it do well. I want to be charmed by it. Currently, I am. And I just don't know if I will continue to be so or not. And for that, for that, time will tell. So, Lakana, it's a good game. I don't know where it'll go next. But that's basically it. That is my first impressions of Lakana. It is good. I enjoy it. I am, I am curious. I am invested. I see the potential and I see the promise. And right now I'm at the point where I kind of want to see that potential and promise deliver. Part of that will be just diving into it more and crafting my own decks as I eventually get my hands on some cards. Again, it's right after Gen Con, and it means it's hard to get your hand on a lot of it right now, but I will be trying to get my hands on more of it. I will be trying to craft decks and play it a lot more. I don't think I'm ever going to really heavily dive into organized play. Even in Magic, I only loosely touched upon that, like, very adjacently. But for me, I want to see... I want to see where this goes. And in any case, until next time, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Kill. Let me know your thoughts on Lakana. I'm very curious. I'm very curious who's buying into this and who's not. I'm very curious who's invested in the potential and the promise and who's kind of just not into TCGs. I, I, I understand you, whichever one of those people you are, because I'm, I'm kind of both, which has me conflicted. In any case, and until next time, I hope you have a good one.